view of uh, normal anatomy of the temporal bone both the axial and coronal views and also sagittal views so today sir will be taking us through the uh, familiar with the pathologies so sir will be showing us pathologies of the temporal bone so i like to call upon dr manoj agrawal sir to take over thank you dr mahajan and uh, very good morning good afternoon good evening to all the participants uh, once again since we have a long way to venture let's uh, dive straight into the talk so <clears throat> now before i begin my talk let me tell you that this is not an all inclusive talk as in it's not necessary that each and every pathology that we can encounter in the temporal bone uh, would be shown today i do not like taking images either from the net or scanning pictures from the textbooks and uh, showing it to the uh, uh, to the participants so the images that i use are usually the patients the 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 conditions that i have seen and that itself is quite exhaustive i can assure you of that but in spite of that if you find a number of pathologies which are not included here it's simply for the reason that i do as i said i do not like using images from the web and so if there is any pathology that is not included here and you would wish to learn more about it please may, please go ahead and uh, uh, look up uh, references publications so on and so forth the second part is that this today we are only going to talk about the pathologies in the temporal bone uh, via v their appearance on ct scan the mri part we will be taking up later on which unfortunately had to be rescheduled but uh, as and when that happens uh, we will not what i want to say is that we will not be including the mri today we are just going to try and familiarize ourselves with the different pathologies as they appear on the ct scan uh, is the voice clear yes sir it is yes, sir it's clear sir is there any lag i'll just annotate because uh, my system is showing that my inter internet connection is a little unstable is there any lag no sir we can show see the annotation now sir okay just give me a minute please sorry for that and the other reminder that i wish to uh, give the participants is that while while i am conducting the talk i do not have the chat window open simultaneously on the screen because it tends to distract and so uh, you might once in a while feel that your question has gone unanswered believe me it's not intentional so in case there is some question that you wish to be answered probably you could repeat it again at the end of the chat but i do not keep the chat window open simply for the fact that it tends to distract okay so uh, i hope that uh, the last two uh, lectures have been uh, useful for you and that it has if not on anything else at least ignited a spark in you to try and uh, read your scans on your own so that you can glean in personally glean it, glean up as much information as possible from these scans and i just hope that uh, you've uh, sort of uh, developed an uh, an own uh, a philosophy for your own self or a protocol for your own self in order to understand the anatomy and hence the pathologies on the temporal bone better so just to recap a we read scans superior to inferior as far as axials are concerned and posterior to anterior as far as the coronals are concerned image uh, uh, structures which are perpendicular to the axis of the scan appear as a circular shadow so, uh, structures which are parallel to the axis of the scan appear as a longitudinal linear shadow and the reference line is the anthropometric line that is the line from the uh, the the orbitometer line from the inferior rim of the orbit to the superior aspect of the external auditory canal
so that is the uh, that is the plane that is the plane of uh, the actual sections okay now if you remember from the last time when we or rather the first lecture when we spoke about the uh, the the actual sections i kept on insisting that keep pay attention to the petrus apex and see that uh, how it contains the marrow so the first few slides that we start with are the slides of the normal variation and the most important variation normal variation that one comes across is the extent of pneumatization of the temporal bone now you can appreciate how grossly pneumatized both the temporal bones are in this patient just look at the extent of the pneumatization look at the petrus apex look at the uh, posterior part of the mastoid cortex and the mastoid uh, bone and the also the cortical bone i mean the cortical bone itself has widened out to accommodate so many periantral cells the antrum is here but look at the extent of pneumatization that is visible on the scan over here and over here and it is bilateral now an important part about the petrus apex is that whether it is sclerotic whether it has bone marrow or whether it has whether it is grossly pneumatized it's usually bilaterally symmetrical very unlikely does it happen that you have pneumatization on one hand and marrow on the other or pneumatization on one hand and uh, uh, a and a sclerotic petrus apex on the other and these scans prove the fact that the pneumatization is usually symmetrical and a pneumatized bone like this can be expect or rather a pneumatized petrus apex i wouldn't say a pneumatization to this extent but a pneumatized petrus apex that is when the petrus apex instead of marrow the commonest constituent of the petrus apex is the marrow but a pneumatized petrus apex can be seen in about 30% of the patients of, of the of the scans that you do what i'll also do is not necessarily all the structures but stru some of the structures i'll keep on you know, identifying them for you so that you know there is also a kind of a recapitulation for us uh, of the normal anatomy even with the pathology slides i'll uh, keep uh, recapitulating the normal uh, anatomy for you so that there is a recapitulation a revision for all of you so i hope everyone is uh, is, is uh, i mean agrees to that and i hope it doesn't sound too repetitive for all of you so a quick recap as far as the normal anatomy is concerned the cochlea the incudus malleolar joint this is the facial nerve here this one over here okay this is the posterior semicircular canal this is the vestibular aqueduct again the cochlea now you can see the vestibular aqueduct here along with the operculum you can see the operculum much better on these cuts over here on in this cut both on the right and on the left side this is the internal auditory canal the basal turn of the cochlea the vestibule the lateral semicircular canal the posterior semicircular canal okay so <clears throat> so this is an example of a grossly pneumatized mastoid bone that's another example of the same patient now look at the extent of the pneumatization this is the lateral sinus this is the jugular bulb look look at the cochlear aqueduct over here and here it's a beautiful uh, scan wherein you see the uh, uh, jugular bulb and look at the uh, horizontal internal carotid artery here and the horizontal internal carotid artery so you can actually appreciate the relationship of the cochlear aqueduct in this particular slice wherein it is closely related to the basal turns of the basal turn of the cochlea to the jugular bulb and to the horizontal internal carotid artery but more important and look at the look how the internal carotid artery seems to be just hanging here both sides right so all i am trying to repeatedly say is look at the extent of pneumatization this particular patient has and god forbid this patient uh, if he or she develops a cholesteatoma the kind of cholesteatoma that the patient would have and the kind of trauma that we as auto surgeons would face trying to give this patient a disease free cavity same patient okay this is another pneumatized bone and this is a magnified view to give you an idea about the petrus apex just remember the previous 
actual scans from the last week's lecture, it was ISO intense. It was of the same intensity as the brain because it had marrow. But now it has one solid piece of air cell. And such an air cell is very, very liable to either developing effusions or even a cholesterol granuloma. Anyway, we'll talk all uh, about all of that later on. But this is a case of a sing singular apical air cell in the petrous apex. And look how beautifully you can visualize the vestibular aqueduct on both these slices. This is slightly inferior and this is slightly superior, but you have the vestibular aqueduct and the vestibular aqueduct over here. Besides that, obviously, the three turns of the cochlea, the promont, the oval window, the lower part of the oval window, because you can see the stapes, stapes here. You can see the lenticular process of the incus here. You can see the incudo stapedial joint. You can see the head of the malleus. You can see the posterior semicircular canal. And you can see the relationship of the vestibular aqueduct with the posterior semicircular canal. Okay, now. Quick question, where is the facial nerve here? Where is the facial nerve here? This is not the facial nerve here. The facial nerve is here. The facial nerve is here. So it makes this the facial recess and this the sinus tympani. Remember the W? So this is the facial nerve, the mastoid segment in, uh, with, at the base of the pyramidal eminence and with the facial recess lateral to it and the <clears throat> sinus tympana medial to it. Similarly, this is the tensor. This was the tensor here. So the facial nerve is here. But do pardon me, I told you very, very categorically that we should always try and read the scans in a sequential manner, lest we might make a mistake. But obviously today we are discussing the pathologies. So the question of uh, reading them in a sequential manner does not arise. You can see the footplate here. Remember the opening, lateral opening of the vestibule, is the foot plate and the inferior opening of the scala tympani is the round window. So this is a lateral opening. So it's the foot plate over here. Same patient, coronal views. Same patient, coronal views. Look at this right panel. The cochlea just seems to be hanging, just seems to be rather, it just seems to be supported by this thin strut of bone, nothing else. It just seems to be supported by this thin strut, strut of bone and with these very uh, uh, fine trabeculations of the, of the periantral air cells or, or the air cells. But, uh, but obviously it is not the periantral air cells because we are much more anterior because we can see the head and the body. We remember bilobe structure. So this is the incudo malleolar joint. This is neither the incus alone, nor the stapes alone, uh, nor the uh, malleus alone. It's a bilobe structure. So it's the incudo malleolar joint. This is the handle of the malleus. And can you see the uh, snake eye appearance here, the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve, the uh, tympanic segment of the facial nerve, and the cobra, and the in totality, the cobra head appearance with the basal turn of the cochlea along with the interscalar septum, the interscalar septum over here, right? And remember C for C and V for V, V for B. So if we are at the cochlea, we see the vertical segment of the uh, internal carotid artery. But look at the, the, the retro labyrinthine apical air cell over here. Just look at the size of the air cell. Again, God forbid this patient develops a polysteotoma. Where would it lead us to? Okay, we are through with the pneumatized uh, mastoid. Now let's take a look at an anterior and dehiscent sigmoid. Now I kept on having the question again in the chat the last time, though I had answered the question at the beginning of the le lecture, the previous presentation as to what is a low-lying dura. Remember on coronal sections, the dura when this tegment, sorry, <clears throat> when this tegment reaches the level of the external auditory canal, it is called a low lying dura. The question had come in again the last time. So I'll just uh, thought maybe I should answer it again that the check, when the tegment comes down almost up to the level of the uh, uh, the external artery canal, it's called a low-lying dura. 
unfortunately we do not have some something like that for the uh, for the and uh, for the anteriorly placed uh, lateral sinus but as you can see on the right side the bone over the lateral sinus is missing and see how close it is to the external auditory canal wall actually the pathology is here the pathology was on the other side this is the normal side that's why it's, I, I called it an anatomy. I'm, I'm anatom is supposed to be. But what we definitely see is that an overlying bone is missing onto the lateral sinus and the lateral sinus is projecting into the mastoid cavity. So in case we were doing a mastoid exploration here and we came in drilling from the outside, drilling the outer cortex, we would get an anteriorly placed and a dehiscent or a dehiscent lateral sinus over here. Okay. This is the jugular bulb. This is the horizontal part of the internal carotid artery. Okay, this is the clivus, right? That's the basi occiput, the foramen magnum. This is the foramen spinosum, foramen ovale. Obviously, you can see the sphenoid sinus and the ethmoidal layer cells. You can see the greater wing of the sphenoid, and you can begin to see the infratemporal fossa as well. More importantly, how thin the tympanic bone is anteriorly, how thin is the tympanic bone anteriorly, remember, I repeatedly keep on mentioning about it simply for the fact that while doing a canal plasty, be very careful. Okay, from an, an anterior and dehiscent jugular bulb, uh, uh, sigmoid lateral sinus, we come to a high jugular bulb. Now, there is definitely a definition for a high jugular bulb. A jugular bulb is considered to be high if it comes in close proximity to the round window. Okay, so this is the same patient, the same patient, the right side and the left side. You can see the jugular bulb housed much more inferiorly, safely away from the basal turn of the cochlea. But here, we see that not only is the jugular bulb high, remember opening of the scala tympani or the labyrinth inferiorly faced, which is the round window with this round window niche over here, the bone covering the, round, the view to the round window membrane. So this is the round window and see the jugular bulb is almost reaching the round window. Not only that, there is no cap of bone over here. So this is a typical high, uh, I mean, uh, high jugular bulb, and it has to come in close proximity to the round, round window for it to be defined as a high jugular bulb. Any idea, friends, what this is? Any idea? Put it in the chat and I'll see later on how many of you. It's uh, 4 uh, 18 right now. So when I see the chat, I'll go to the time frame of 4 18 and see how many of you could have uh, could, could answer that correctly. Any idea what this white artifact is? This is actually a shepherd grommet that I had inserted in this patient. This patient had to, for some reason, undergo a CT after the grommet insertion. And this is a shepherd grommet. Now imagine what would have happened if I had just made the nick a little lower down. I mean, if I had just created the myringotomy a little lower down, this is about six weeks after the grommet has been inserted. So there is no fluid anymore over here. But prior to the insertion of the grommet, this area would have been full of fluid. One might have said that, sir, you could have seen the higher jugular bulb through the tympanic membrane with effusion. Can you make it out? No. And I went ahead and I did the grommet. God forbid if I had made the myringotomy a lower down, I would have had a bleeding condition, a bleed of, I mean, a, a, a excessive bleeding over here. Anyway, uh, God saved us, uh, uh, surgeon's luck. So, Tegmen, lateral canal, superior canal, vestibule, facial nerve, internal auditory canal, jugular bulb. Okay, I need to mention this. This is called, I forgot the last time when we did the coronals. This is the petrous apex. This is the occiput. So this is called the petro-occipital fissure. It's called the petro-occipital fissure and through it passes an emissary vein which connects the jugular bulb to 
the inferior petrosal sinus. Mind you, within the temporal bone, within the temporal bone, there are two, besides the lateral sinus, there are two sinuses. One is the superior petrosal sinus along the superior wall of, along the superior border of the petrous apex. And the other is the inferior petrosal sinus along the inferior border of the petrous apex. Both these sinuses, it's actually a triangle. So you have to understand it this way. This is the transverse sinus. This is the lateral sinus. This is the jugular bulb and then the internal jugular vein. And somewhere here is the cavernous sinus. So the superior petrosal sinus connects the junction of the transverse with the lateral sinus to the cavernous sinus and the inferior petrosal sinus connects somewhere the area of the jugular bulb with the cavernous sinus. So it's a triangular drainage. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the petrooccipital fissure, which has an emissary vein, which in turn connects the jugular bulb to the inferior petrosal sinus. Sagittal view of the same patient. Now, friends, can you make out the grommet, the shepherd grommet there? Beautifully, you can see the rim of the grommet with the lumen in between. You can see the jugular bulb high above, high riding jugular bulb. This is the jugular bulb on the opposite side. You can see the mastoid segment of the facial nerve here, but the high riding jugular bulb is actually occluding, ob obstructing your view to the mastoid segment of the facial nerve on the, in the left panel. Mind you, the left panel is actually the right ear and the right, pan the right panel is actually the left ear. You see the superior se semicircular canal, you see the openings of the lateral semicircular canal and you see also a part of the posterior semicircular canal over here. Sorry, this was not the mastoid segment. I beg your pardon. This was the C. This is what happens if you're reading scans out of context, not in a serial fashion. You can see the molar tooth, partial molar tooth configuration of the incudomaleolar joint. You can see the tegmen. Obviously, you can see the middle cranial fossa. You can see the posterior cranial fossa. Dr. Mahajan, should I uh, continue to identify the normal structures? Yes, no? A feedback, please? Yeah, yeah, sir. I should continue to identify yes. the normal structures as well? Yes, sir, yes, sir. So that will be the revision for the... Yeah, sure. Uh, right. Again, one final view at the high jugular bulb, and I want you to, I want to magnify it for you. Pay attention. When I magnify it for you, you will see the jugular bulb attaching itself i cannot annotate see <clears throat> look at the uh, oops sorry you can see the tympanic membrane here okay but the jugular bulb is lower down there's a thick piece of bone in between now let's go to the other side you can see the thin tympanic membrane here. You can see the white jugular bulb. You can see how the jugular bulb is actually splattered along the tympanic membrane with, with, I mean, without a covering over here. So this is an example of a high jugular bulb. Okay, so much uh, about the jugular bulb. Remember, I had promised you while doing the axial and the coronal scans that I will show you what a dehiscent internal carotid artery looks like. Two different patients, two different patients, say, uh, sorry, not two different patients, two different views, one of the normal internal carotid artery and one dehiscent. So you can see you have the thin plate of bone though I have repeatedly told you that the bone over the internal carotid artery, especially its horizontal segment, can be very, very thin. So be very careful while doing blind curatage, trying to remove granulation tissue from here. But you can very clearly see that the bone over the lateral aspect of the horizontal part of the internal carotid artery in close proximity, this is the eustachian tube, so in close proximity to the eustachian tube is missing, okay? It is missing. So this is a dehiscent or a dehiscent internal carotid artery. This is the jugular bulb here, the basal turn of the cochlea, the cochlear aqueduct, so on and so forth. Okay, 
from normal anatomical variations. Now we gradually move towards the pathologies and we take the simpler pathologies first and move, move over to the more complicated pathologies as the presentation progresses. Fair, fair enough? Okay. I'm sure most of you by now have identified the problem that is there in this particular scan, and that is an ossicular discontinuity. As we can see, or, I mean, I have tried in most of my slides to give you a normal view in the right panel. It might not be the right ear, mind you, the right temporal bone, but I have tried my level best that the right panel has the normal view at the same level as the left panel so that you can understand the difference between the two sides better. So you can see the head of malleus. You can see the body and, and the short process of the incus. This is the fossa incudis, but you see that instead of of being joined together, giving rise to the classical incudomaleola, I mean, to the ice cream cone appearance, they are separate, they are away from each other. And so this is a case of an uh, ossicular discontinuity and the kind of iso intense shadow that we see here, especially in the attic area, I would assume that this is, and this turned out to be in a patient with of cholesteatoma, of a localized attic cholesteatoma. You can see the internal auditory canal. You can see the canal for the co cochlear nerve. You can see the basal and the apical turn of the cochlea. You can see the interscalar septum, the modulus. This is the vestibule, the lateral semicircular canal. This is the opening of the vestibule. So a little lower down, we would probably, obviously you, this is a slightly uh, oblique view taken in the actual sections anyway, but the fact is that this is the, the vestibule, the lateral semicircular canal, the posterior canal, and this is where your facial nerve is. So, and, and since we are in the attic area, so obviously we are close to the second genu of the facial nerve, which makes this the the tensor tympani and the cochlear form process. And you can see that though there is a localized cholesteatoma here, the cochlear form process is still intact. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Same thing from a different perspective. Now, this was a case of ossicular discontinuity because of, because of any idea, friends? Can you see something here? Anything that you can see here? Can you see a small rent here? Okay, so this was secondary to trauma. Though there was no hematoma here, but as you can see, there is no iso intense shadow within the, this is obviously the left side. So this is the left side. So there is no shadow in the mastoid cavity, in the periantral air cells, the antrum, but yet, we find that the malleus is separated from the incus and we see, obviously, I mean, this is this was a patient that I had seen. So I, knew, I had the history, but there was a bigger fracture much lower down, much lower down at the, uh, sorry, at the junction of the, uh, the, uh, the, the squama temporalis with the occiput. But uh, you can definitely make out a small rent here, though surprisingly there is no hematoma and there was a separation of the incudomaleolar joint. This is again the tensor. This is not the facial nerve, friends, because your facial nerve is here. This is the sinus tympani, the facial recess, the basal turn, and the apical turn of the turns of the the middle turns of the cochlea with the osseous spiral, the internal artery canal, the normal appearance here. Definitely the facial nerve tympanic segment. This is the facial of tympanic segment over here. This is not the, uh, the, the the tensor tympani muscle, the basal turn of the cochlea with the for nerve for the foramen for the cochlear nerve, that is the modulus, the vestibule, the lateral semicircular canal, posterior canal, the vestibular aqueduct, so on and so forth. Okay, now let's move one step ahead. Okay. Remember, this one gives you a lovely view of the uh, snake eye appearance. Remember, I had told you the last time that though you're not able to make out the snake eye appearance on the normal coronal, I will definitely show you some views where it will be much better visualized. And there you go. You have the snake eye appearance, the labyrinthine segment and the tympanic segment. So this is the snake eye appearance. The coils of the, the turns of the cochlea are not very well visible, but still you can make out the cobra head appearance. This is the interscalar septum. But the idea of this particular uh, slice is 
not to show you the uh, the the snake eye appearance. The idea is to show you that there is a pathology in the tympanic cavity in the attic, which still has not eroded, uh, caused the caused dehiscence of the facial nerve. So let's magnify. Okay, you can see the thin plate of bone still intact over the lateral aspect of the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. There is this iso intense shadow. The handle of the malleus surprisingly is not seen here. I don't know whether it was eroded or not. I don't remember this case. This was many, many years ago. But we can see the malleus head. We can see the malleus head entirely occupied by an iso intense shadow. You can see the blunting of the scutum here. You can see the blunting of the scutum here, but more importantly, you see that the bone over the, the rim, thin rim of bone over the lateral aspect of the tympanic membrane uh, of the tympanic segment of the facial nerve is intact. Do remember, friends, that the that CT temporal does not different. All of them as the same have, will have the same appearance as a, uh, as an ISO intense shadow as an ISO intense shadow on a CT, and you will not be able to differentiate as to which of those it is unless and until you have a good history, a good clinical examination, and some snippets, some uh, some uh, some uh, you know hints that I'll give you during the course of the. Uh, talk now same situation same situation okay but with the lateral aspect of the tympanic segment the bone over the lateral aspect of the tympanic segment eroded okay so you still have the snake eye appearance so in fact what does this tell you that for you to know whether the tympanic segment of the facial nerve is dehiscent or not, it's the coronal view, which is the better option than the actual view, right? I'm sure you would agree to it. So you can see the snake eye appearance, you can see the cobra head appearance, but now you see that the lateral wall over the tympanic segment is missing. Not only that, the roof, which is the tegmen, is eroded. Not only that, look at the extent of bone destruction over the scutum area. Okay, so this is an extem, I mean, a more extensive cholesteatoma, which and also it appears to us as if the malleus handle, rather, so I beg your pardon, the malleus head has been partially eroded. Compare it to this particular picture. As I said, this is right side, left panel, right side, right panel, right side. Okay, head of malleus, beautiful, vertical, remember. Vertical axis, oblique axis, body of incus, vertical axis, head of malleus, scutum, lateral process, neck of malleus. So your Prusax space, the tympanic segment, the labyrinthine segment, and the uh, the uh, the basal turns of the cochlea. So snake eye appearance with cobra head here as well. The uh, uh, the vertical part of the internal carotid artery. Now you might say that, sir, here too, the, temp the, the bone is missing. Yes, we do know that even in spite of the patient not harboring a polystyroma, even sometimes during a normal tympanoplasty or a stepidotomy, we do find that the tympanic segment of the facial nerve is dehiscent. The worry is not whether the facial nerve is dehiscent while doing a tympanoplasty or while doing a stepidotomy. The bigger worry is a dehiscent facial nerve while while, while doing a mastoid surgery. Okay, look at the extent of the dehiscence over here. I mean, in the previous one, uh, in this particular slice, what we had were the two uh, segments of the facial nerve separately. We've moved a little more anteriorly. Mind you, it's a different patient because the side has changed. This was the this was the right side, but we have come to the left side. But, what, but we've come a little more anterior. This is not the facial nerve, dear friends. This is not the facial nerve. This, this is the facial nerve, so it's the geniculate ganglion area. 
It's the geniculate ganglion area of the facial nerve. So we have an extensive cholesteatoma in the anterior part of the attic, which has eroded the bone over the lateral. The bone over the superior part of the geniculate ganglion might not be there. Remember, I had told you that the geniculate ganglion can lie on the roof, on the roof of the petrous apex right underneath the dura. So the, the, there might not be a bony roof over the, uh, on top of the geniculate ganglion, but definitely the bony part over the lateral aspect of the geniculate ganglion is missing as is parts, uh, as are parts of the tegmen. Compare this to this one over here, basal turn of the cochlea, geniculate ganglion, you can still see the roof. This geniculate ganglion does have a roof. The, the tensor tympani, part of the head of the malleus, tympanic membrane, vertical part of the internal carotid artery. And we can definitely see that the, at the tegmen is intact. Okay. Okay. From here on, we move a little more sinister complication and that is a lateral semicircular canal fistula. This is a case where the fistula is very, very frankly visible. Same patient, the right ear on the left panel, the left ear on the right panel, vestibule, beautiful signet ring appearance of the lateral semicircular canal, posterior vestibular aqueduct with the operculum, but we can see that the bone, the compact, dense compact bone over the lateral aspect of the lateral semicircular canal is missing in the right, uh, <coughs> right ear. And there is this soft tissue shadow occupying the area adjacent to the lateral semicircular canal in the attic, in the antrum, in the aditus. So this is a typical case of a lateral semicircular canal fistula, whereas the bone over here on the left side, in, in the left ear, the left temporal bone is absolutely intact. One, one tip that I would like to tell you why obviously I know that this patient had cholesteatoma because I had seen the patient clinically, but it could have been something else also. But one tip that I would like to give you is that how there's once, I mean, it's, it, it might not be the gospel truth, but if you find that there is a shadow, an ISO intense shadow, I beg your pardon, I'll just have a sip of water, please. There's an iso intense shadow in the mastoid antrum. If you see that the trabeculations of the periantral air cells are maintained, Chances are it's not cholesteatoma. Chances are it's either effusion or even granulation. Granulation does not easily cause erosion of the trabeculations of the periantral air cells. Remember this. Whereas cholesteatoma very easily and causes and is very notorious for causing erosion of the periantral air cells. I mean, most of the time we do see that. The moment we open and entered into the mastoid antrum, we see one big cavity totally occupied by the cholesteatoma matrix. So that is one tip that I can give you as far as trying to identify whether the iso intense shadow is a cholesteatoma or a granulation tissue or effusion. Effusion definitely by no means is going, is going to erode the trabeculations. Internal auditory canal, petrous apex. Now compare this petrous apex, friends. Compare these petrous apex with the previous petrous apex that we saw at the very beginning of the, of the presentation. See, this is iso intense. So this has fatty marrow and look, it is symmetrical. This is the same patient. This is the same patient. So the petrous apex is symmetrical on uh, in this, uh, in most of the cases, either it will be marrow or air cell or sclerotic. It's usually symmetrical. You can also see the scutum over here. You can see the hourglass configuration of the aditus, the <coughs> and uh, so of the attic, the aditus, and the aditus and adentrum. Right now, why have I put this scan? See, this is the same patient. This is the same patient. You do not see. You can see the faint shadow. Uh, are you able to see the faint signet ring shadow over here, Doctor Mahajan? Yeah, yeah, sir. We can see, sir. Yeah, we can see. Yeah. So you can see the faint shadow, but it is not as robust as this one. But we do see a dimpling, dimpling over the lateral aspect. So this, suppose, suppose no one had given you this cut. 
no one had you for some reason the radiol the the radiology that came into you did not have this even this should raise your antenna regarding the presence of a lateral semicircular canal now let me tell you the dictum most of the standard textbooks my torah my bible my gita my quran for radiology are three or four books and i i am absolutely blind about them obviously the first and foremost is schwartz then you have som curtin som and curtin and and you have valva sorry so <clears throat> sorry so it is very very clearly mentioned especially in som and curtin that if you find a dimpling on an actual section in three contiguous slices in three contiguous slices then it is a definite fistula if in one or two the chances are very high but if on three contiguous slices of actual section you find a dimpling on the in the region of the lateral semicircular canal you can be rest assured that the patient has a uh fistula of over the lateral semicircular canal you might say that sir we will obviously know that the patient has a fistula because the patient will be complaining of some kind of a dizziness there would be a sudden deterioration of hearing not necessary you can i have had number of cases wherein on surgery obviously i do not do a ct temporal in each and every patient but wherein during surgery i found that the bony labyrinth was eroded yet the patient had no symptoms the patient had an isolated conductive hearing loss and the patient was definitely not vertiginous okay so if you find a dimpling like this on three contiguous sections then i will give you an explanation for that also as to why can it happen that the patient might be vertiginous or might not be vertiginous as far as a fistula is concerned okay so dimpling on three contiguous sections definite uh, uh, fistula obviously always ask for an hrct now this is my fight again with a lot of my friends as an hrct is sub 1 mm usually 0.6 mm friends if you look at the lateral semicircular canal if you look at it sideways how much is the height of the lateral semicircular canal how much 1.5 to 2 mm 2.5 mm if someone is giving you a 1.5 mm cut the first cut might be here and the second cut might be here and you would lose out the fistula so make sure it is an hrct the cuts are less than the slices are less than 1 mm then patient coronal view then patient coronal view nothing really needs to be explained the scutum is partly eroded look at the sharpness of the scutum here you do not see any ossicle obviously i forgot to mention none of the ossicles are visible here in the actual sections none of the ossicles are visible here anyway you do not see any ossicles here you do see the short process of the incus here you can see the short process of the incus here superior lateral facial nerve vestibule basal turn of cochlea internal internal auditory canal foot plate of stapes incudo stapedial joint or the lenticular process but here do you find anything near nothing you have the vestibule you have the lateral you can probably make out the head of the stapes here and it was there during surgery you can make out the head of this this whitish shadow hyper intense shadow within this iso intensity is the head of the stapes but you do not make out the bone over the lower aspect of the tympanic segment of the facial nerve so there is a probability that the tympanic segment is dehiscent obviously you see this iso intense shadow you see the same shadow in the mesotympanum as well okay this is a different patient uh, what it needs to be seen here obviously by now you know that there is a lateral semicircular canal fistula but what do you need to see here compared to this i'll zoom in again please pay attention you can see the vestibule is iso intense that is its shadow is similar signal is same similar to that of brain you can see the cochlea is iso intense you can see the lower, the lateral semicircular canal iso intense okay now let's zoom in here 
do you see this hypo intensity in the vestibule do you see this entire lateral semicircular canal hypo intense why why this is a pneumo labyrinth air bubble has entered inside the labyrinth so it probably means that not only is the bony semicircular canal eroded it is the membranous labyrinth which is eroded as well you see the between the, the 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 gap between the bony and the membranous labyrinth is very very minimal so air can it will be very difficult to for air to enter between the two layers but if the so I'll, I'll draw it the other way around so yeah but but if the say if the membranous labyrinth is intact but the bony is not air for air to enter here will be very difficult but if this is gone then air can enter much more easily and this is a patient which has a higher chance of being vertiginous because of more movement within the endolymphatic cavity as well you know there is more stimulation in this patient of the sensory end organs of balance compared to this patient it compared to this patient right so this the, the, a patient with a pneumo labyrinth has a higher chance of being vertiginous i'm not saying that this patient cannot be vertiginous in fact this patient was vertiginous this patient did have a, a, a sudden deterioration of hearing but it is not a gospel truth that i mean if this fistulous communication is very small the patient might not have overt symptoms of the fistula but this patient has a much higher chance of having vertiginous symptoms along with other inner ear symptoms what else what, what do we move on to now as i said we will move from the simpler to the more complicated diseases this is what we call a petrous bone cholesteatoma okay it's a petrous bone cholesteatoma wherein the cholesteatoma through the supra apical path or the infra labyrinthine path or the infracochlear path spreads towards the petrous apex this is the petrous apex over here so you can very well see you have this soft tissue shadow here the outer cortex is eroded you have this soft tissue shadow here which above these this is the superior semicircular canal above the superior semicircular canal is going medial to the labyrinthine block this is the labyrinthine block this is the lateral semicircular canal this is the vestibule the cochlea the internal auditory canal and beyond that the cholesteatoma is extending towards the petrous apex so this is a petrous bone cholesteatoma there's a lovely paper by my professor professor mario sana about the classifications of the petrous bone cholesteatoma i would suggest that you go ahead i mean you uh, download it from the net and read it so this is a petrous bone cholesteatoma with a supra labyrinthine extension towards the petrous apex and you can see the tegmen eroded here okay this is the vertical part of the internal carotid artery <clears throat> same same patient axial view okay the other previous one was a coronal view see how extensive is you you don't see any trabeculations here do you see any trabeculations here no you don't see any trabeculations here you can see the superior canal here and the superior canal here that's the those are the two limbs of the superior canal but you can see that it's extending medial medial and lateral to the superior canal towards the petrous apex and this is the tegmen you can see the tegmen i'm sorry i put the arrow here the arrow actually should have been here you can see the tegmen eroded and the uh, the pathology communicating with the middle this is the middle cranial fossa here the pathology communicating with the middle cranial fossa over here okay so this is a petrous bone cholesteatoma with a apical extension through the supra labyrinthine part okay the same this is another petrous bone cholesteatoma that was the left side this is the right side this is a petrous bone cholesteatoma okay see how extensive is the cholesteatoma it's extending towards the petrous apex and how it has eroded the wall of the basal turn of the cochlea compare it to the other side the cobra head or the snake eye appearance 
cobra head or the snake eye appearance head of malleus long axis vertical axis head of malleus head of malleus badly embedded within the i'm not sure whether this i would yeah this would be the head of malleus because we are at the anterior part of the cochlea it wouldn't be the uh, incus but grossly i mean the the pathology surrounding i mean in the antrum in the attic in the middle ear cavity surrounding the ossicle completely causing erosion of the tegmen and eroding into the basal turn of the cochlea right so that's the erosion by a peters bone cholesteatoma again the supralabyrinthine root not only that not only that if you if you see here clearly you see the lateral the internal auditory canal coming here so probably I do not have the sequence uh, over here, but probably I do not remember. Again, this was many, many years ago, so I do not remember whether this has added, this had actually and, uh, eroded the roof of the internal auditory canal or not. So that's an extensive post-Petersburg cholesteatoma causing cochlear fistula. Okay, from cholesteatomas, let's move on to something different. Something uh, probably we wouldn't get a chance to see very often, and that is an aneurysm of the internal carotid artery so this is the right side this is the left side this is the horizontal internal carotid artery with the second with the genu and we can see that not only is the bone missing we can see a lobulated iso intense shadow extending from the carotid artery towards the hypotympanum and towards the mesotympanum so this is an, an aneurysm of the internal carotid artery which had presented as a pulsatile mass in the middle ear cavity okay the same thing there is the vertical part the horizontal part of the internal carotid artery head on view head on view coronal view hence i mean this is the part of the vertical part and this is the horizontal so we are very close to the genu so this is right but what do we see here that from the vertical part from the vertical i'm sorry it could be the basal turn of the cochlea beg your pardon yeah this is the vertical part of the internal carotid artery yes this I'm, i beg your pardon this is the basal turn of the cochlea with the, uh, the, the these are the turns of the cochlea not very well visualized here this the interstellar septum but with the snake eye appearance and you can see that from the vertical part of the internal carotid artery the aneurysm is extending here and it is coming into the hypotympanum for us to see from here if possible so this is an aneurysm of the internal carotid artery you can see the ossicles over here okay and this is after the aneurysm was embolized after the aneurysm was embolized obviously it's a different patient mind you because that was a patient on the right side this was also the right side but this is on the left side this is after the embolization of uh, with the wire mesh this is what it looks like uh, once the aneurysm, which is a, a valid treatment for small aneurysms of the intra intrapetrous part of the internal carotid artery. Okay. Not always is a dehiscent tegmen an indicator of a middle ear pathology, and this particular case proves it. This is uh, the same patient, left panel right ear, right panel left ear, and it's a case of bilateral meningoencephalic herniation. You can see that the tegmen is missing on both sides. The tegmen is missing on both sides and the encephalum is herniating of, or let's say the, the, the intracranial matter is herniating. We do not know whether it's a meningocele or a meningoencephalocele unless and until we've done an MRI. But what we definitely see is that the intracranial content is herniating into the attic on both sides. Over here, the herniation is much more. Why? Because if you see, you can see the body of the incus, the long process, the lenticular process, but the body of the incus is spared. And you can see that over here, the body of the incus is actually coming in close contact with the, uh, uh, with the, uh, with the herniated material. Yes, there could be some amount of fluid also because the herniated material might not always necessarily totally encompass the, uh, the, the incus, but you definitely see that the, the level of the herniation is uh, much more extensive over here via the opposite side, okay? Same patient, bilateral view again, okay? In the same section, I mean, in the same uh, cut, so you can see the 
the the clearly see the meningoencephalic herniation you can see that the scutum is not eroded here you can see that the scutum is not eroded here so definitely it's not a case of a chronic inflammatory erosion of the tegmen and you can see that the incus also is not eroded the incus is intact appears intact at least so naturally the, this is uh, and it's very unlikely that uh, the herniation would be you know, I mean, you would have a bilateral cholesteatoma with bilateral erosion of the tegment, so on and so forth. Okay. A little more interesting. What do we see here? Obviously, I should have actually, I made a mistake. I should have removed the titles from each and every slide. And this would have been more fun quizzing you along as we, move, as we moved ahead with the uh, presentation. But then since I've put in the titles, obviously it is obvious to you that this is a case of a tumor of the facial nerve, the tympanic segment. Again, for your comparison and ease of understanding, you can see the tympanic segment of the facial nerve here. You can see the head, and I beg your pardon, the, the arrow came in over the head of the stapes, but this is the tympanic segment of the facial nerve here. And see how widened the, the tympanic segment of the facial nerve is over here. Now, the usual tumors of uh, that one can encounter within the intramastoid part of the the mast the, within the intratemporal part of the facial nerve is either a hemangioma, though it's more common at the geniculate ganglion area. It could be a neuroma, which is more common. But since this is on the tympanic segment and pretty close to the geniculate ganglion, it's probably uh, <clears throat> Uh, uh, part of uh, probably a hemangioma. Obviously, we would have to have other sections as well. So you could have a hem uh, hemangioma and a neuroma. These are the common tumors. The hemangioma is more common at the geniculate ganglion because that's much more vascular. It's highly, highly vascular, whereas a neuroma is much more common at the mastoid segment of the facial nerve uh, because of, and it, because it uh, and because the vascularity is much lesser there. So this is a case of a tumor arising from the tympanic segment and the second genu of the facial nerve. But what we definitely see is that, again, let's zoom in over here. You can see that the lateral semicircular canal is intact and this bone has not been eroded by the tumor. These are snippets of information that you have to have no, I mean, just the fact that you've diagnosed that there is this intra and there is this facial nerve tumor here is not enough. So suppose you're going to operate upon this patient and, and for some reason, this, this patient had a, uh, 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 an erosion of the uh, lateral semicircular canal with the uh, secondary to the tumor. So the, the, obviously you would say that the patient would be vertiginous, the patient would present with sensorineural loss, but at the same time, the surgery would actually ag ag aggravate the sensorineural loss for the patient. Okay, so these are the other informations that you need to also glean from your scans. Tegmen, okay. Okay, same patient, same patient, different view. Same patient, different view. So you have the, oops, sorry, not the same patient. I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. This is the left side and this is uh, the right side. This is the annulus. This is the area of the foot plate. So this is the pyramid. So this is actually arising from the mastoid segment of the facial nerve. This is arising from the mastoid segment of the facial nerve. Again, for your ease of understanding, the normal mastoid segment of the facial nerve, a picture of the normal mastoid segment of the facial nerve has been provided side by side. So look at the width here and look at the width here. Okay, so this is the genu part, whereas that this was the tympanic segment part. So this is the tympanic segment part this is the genu part of the facial nerve, which is uh, which is harboring uh, <clears throat> uh, an SOL. Basal turns of the cochlea, vestibule, posterior semicircular canal, vestibular aqueduct. Basal turns of the cochlea, vestibule, posterior semicircular canal, vestibular aqueduct, and a small part of the internal auditory canal still visible. Mind you, this is not the cochlear aqueduct. You can see it extending up to here, so it's the internal auditory canal, the lowest part of the internal auditory canal visible. Okay, same scenario, different tumor. So now what do we see? We see that the tumor is occupying the geniculate ganglion area. This is the geniculate ganglion area. 
This is the basal turn of the cochlea. Okay, this is the basal turn of the cochlea over here. Okay, so this is the geniculate ganglion area. And we can see this bone, this uh, whitish iso intense shadow. But now I'll give you the way in which you can actually differentiate between a facial nerve neuroma and a facial nerve hemangioma. This is a histologically proven case of facial nerve hemangioma. Look at the tumor here. You can see these spicules of bone. This is the intralesional calcification within the tumor, which is a hallmark of, an, of a hemangioma rather than a neuroma. It's the typical bearded appearance or a salt and pepper appearance of a hemangioma because there is, mind you, there is no intralesional calcification in a neuroma. So if, if we go back to the previous slide and we zoom in over here, we see this in the, the, the shadow is homogeneous. The shadow here is homogeneous. It is not showing us any spicules or any intralesional calcification. But if we go to the next one and zoom in again, we see that the lesion is not homogeneous. It is heterogeneous with these, these, high, these hyper intense shadows within the substance of the overall shadow. So this is the typical salt and pepper appearance of a geniculate ganglion hemangioma. Now, because, of the, because we are here, I just like to answer this. Some uh, of our friends had asked us, what's the woodpecker sign? I mean, not really very important, but what's the woodpecker sign? Basically, the internal auditory canal the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve. Now imagine, suppose the genital ganglion tumor had not been there, this would have been like this and like this. So I'll just draw the woodpecker for you. So the woodpecker would have been the tympanic segment of the facial nerve, the geniculate ganglion, the labyrinthine segment and the internal carotid artery. Apparently this looks like a woodpecker and it's called the woodpecker sign. Anyway. I'm not particularly fond of it, so I did not mention. Okay, vestibule here, lateral canal, posterior canal. Vestibule here, posterior canal, you can see the lateral canal, the faint shadow, you can see the labyrinthine segment, geniculate ganglion, the GSPN, the greater superficial petrosal nerve, and the entire tympanic segment of the facial nerve. Same patient, same geniculate ganglion tumor, that's an hemangioma, again, a comparative view, a comparative view, scutum for you, incudomelular joint, not yet affected. Mind you, geniculate ganglion, uh, geniculate ganglion hemangiomas are, can be pretty aggressive. In fact, they can actually cause erosion, not only of the ossicles, but they can act. Because remember, geniculate ganglion, where is the geniculate ganglion? It's right on top of the cochlea, the cobra head appearance. Cobra head appearance, the turns of the cochlea with the uh, tympanic segment and the facial, uh, and the, the labyrinthine segment, and the two of them joining together to form the geniculate ganglion. So it's in close proximity to the uh, basal turn of the cochlea. So it's, an extensive geniculate ganglion tumor can actually erode into the basal turn of the cochlea. So this is the woodpecker appearance, you know. This is the supposedly woodpecker appearance, whatever that might, I mean. Anyways, so uh, this is the incudomelular joint, the ice cream cone appearance. The So let's see, zoom in, let's see whether we have the intralesional uh, calcification or not. I'm sorry. Yeah, we do. We can see the hyper intense shadows within the, the, the hyper intense spicules within the uh, body of the tumor. And so this is the typical salt and pepper appearance of the uh, geniculate ganglion. Hemangioma, not a neuroma. Neuroma is homogeneous. Hemangioma is uh, heterogeneous. Now you might say that why is this, this man harboring, I mean, harping on the fact as to whether it's a neuroma or a hemangioma, I'll tell you why. You'll give better results to the patient surgically if it's a hemangioma rather than a neuroma. The neuroma is arising from the nerve body, right? It's arising from the nerve body. So there is no way you can remove the neuroma without sacrificing a part of the nerve. So you'll actually have to sacrifice a part of the nerve and either do uh, uh, mobilize the ends and do an end-to-end -end anastomosis, or you can have, or you'll have to do a graft, a sural nerve graft, or whatever. I had the fortune. I mean, I had operated upon a patient like this a few years back, but. But a hemangioma, a hemangioma, because it arises from the vasculature around the fascia. And to go back, if you are doing an end-to-end -end anastomosis, I mean, if you are doing a resection of the facial nerve, 
there is no way you're giving the patient patient a, report, a result of better than uh, house back brackman grading three or four i mean three is i'm being generous it will be four five six whatever however good your anastomosis your end to end anastomosis or however good your sural nerve grafting might be but a geniculate ganglion hemangioma or a hemangioma around the facial nerve because it arises from the vasculature it's a separate entity it is sub, it is surrounding the facial nerve causing compression of the facial nerve leading to facial paralysis but it is not arising from the body of the facial nerve so it is possible for you to gently peel off the hemangioma from the bud from from the nerve body from the trunk of the nerve and thereby maintain the integrity of the facial nerve and give a better result that is why it is so important preoperatively to understand whether you dealing with the with a with a hemangioma or a neuroma because your prognosis your outcome depends upon that and you have to counsel the patient accordingly same patient geniculate ganglion hemangioma i just put in the mri slides we would be doing the mri later on probably sometime next week anyway so this is the geniculate ganglion hemangioma that you see and see again what do i want to show you i want to show you that it is close to the temporal lobe it is close to the temporal lobe why but you can see a thin ice a hypo intense shadow which probably means that the bone is intact partly intact over the geniculate ganglion though there is some hyper intensity over here as well whether that is tumorous or whether that is a reactionary inflammation we cannot say that but we what we definitely see is a thin ice or hypo intense shadow over here probably indicating that the bone over the geniculate ganglion is still intact though we do not see anything of that sort over here we see the tumor in close in 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 contact with the temporal lobe all these things are very very important just the fact that okay i have a tumor i have a tumor here and it's a fish of tumor doesn't end the responsibility i mean is not the end of the responsibility for you just a while ago i told you this is a, a, a different case of a geniculate ganglion hemangioma a while ago i told you see how the geniculate ganglion hemangioma has expanded the area of the geniculate ganglion with the bone over the geniculate ganglion intact but more important than that what is it that i want to show you i want to show you the intralesional calcification giving it a speculated or a salt pepper appearance but more importantly i want to show you the erosion into the basal turn of the cochlea so you can see that the basal turn of the cochlea this entire part is the tumor the tumor is not ending here this entire part is the tumor so this tumor is eroding into the basal turn of the cochlea okay you can see the basal turn the, the turns of the cochlea the beautiful i'm sure by now you are sick and tired of me telling you about the snake eye appearance and the cobra head appearance so i'm not going to repeat that any further for you you can see the internal carotid artery over here you can see the petrous apex see how the petrous apex is made up of marrow over here okay right let's move a little more medial again this is an mri picture just to give you an idea that the third location of a hemangioma concerning the facial nerve is in the internal auditory canal it's in the internal auditory canal and the surprising part is you know the the funny part is that though it's a it's supposed to be it is it is considered i mean i have a publication with professor sana and there are other publications of facial nerve hemangiomas and though it is considered to be this tumor here this is the internal auditory canal you can see the basal turn of the cochlea you can see the vestibule you can see the lateral semicircular canal you can see the cp angle you can see the part of the brain stem and the cerebellum so this is considered a part to be uh, uh, considered under the purview of a facial nerve hemangioma but it tends to cause sensory neural loss more often rather than a facial nerve paralysis and and very often the facial nerve paralysis here is fluctuating why because the facial nerve supposedly the facial nerve hemangioma in this area actually arises from the scarpa's ganglion it arises from the scarpa's ganglion rather than the facial nerve per se and that's the reason why it tends to cause a sensory neural hearing loss with or without a fluctuating here facial nerve paralysis rather than a frank 
facial nerve paralysis. Okay, so this is a facial nerve tumor arising in the internal artery canal. Now let's move on to a, a, a very very different condition. Uh, not, not something that we see in our routine practice very often, but we can definitely encounter it, and that is congenital cholesteatoma. It's a congenital cholesteatoma of, I mean, two different patients. On the on the one side, okay, you 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 find the congenital cholesteatoma extending even into the mastoid antrum, but on the other side, you can see it res, uh, restricted only only to the uh, uh, to the uh, uh, to the uh, to the mesotympanic cavity. So this is a case of congenital cholesterol. In fact, I'll zoom in over here. This is a better picture. Again, similar to that jugular bulb that we had seen. Similar to the jugular bulb that we had seen. Can you see the congenital cholesterol actually in contact with the under surface of the tympanic membrane? So you can see the, under, the, the cholesterol in contact with the undersurface of the tympanic membrane, correct? But now let me point out something interesting for you. Can you see all this, the isointense shadow? Okay, so what do you think could it be? Is it an extension of the cholesterol? Maybe, maybe not. I would say no. Why? A, the cholesterol is localized here. The cholesterol is localized here. Mind you, this is not the... This is the cholesterol is localized here. And B, something that I was telling you from the earlier part, uh, parts of the presentation, the, in, the trabeculations are still maintained. So probably this is causing, this cholesterol is causing some kind of a eustachian tube blockade, which has led to a fluid collection within the mastoid antrum, rather than this being cholesterol itself. But then that again is not a given. And obviously, the final confirmation of the whole fact would be only after surgery. Let's move a little more lower down with more complicated tumors. And so now we come to a glomus jugulare. We come to a glomus jugulare. One is the pre-contrast view and the other is the post-contrast view. So this is the post-contrast view. This is the pre-contrast view. You can see the extensive tumoral involvement at the base of the skull in close proximity to the jugular bulb. And you can see how destructive the lesion is how destructive the lesion is. See over here, the, the trabeculations are destroyed to some extent, not necessarily. Again, this need not be part of the glomus. The glomus is occluding. See, it's obstructing the eustachian tube. So it's not always necessary that the iso intense shadow that you see in the attic or in the antrum is always an extension of the pathology. The moment the pathology blocks the eustachian tube, that's it. The moment the aeration is blocked, you can always have a secondary effusion. Anyway, you can see the glomus jugulare, the, 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 the part of the tumor extending into the external auditory canal. Okay, you can, but on the other side, the, the, the integrity of the bone is maintained. So this is a glomus jugulare tumor of the left side. This is much more localized glomus and so this is a glomus tympanicum type a okay this is a glomus tympanicum type a a small glomus here and a slightly wider bigger glomus here again if we magnify the view here we'll find uh, uh, <clears throat> the glomus adherent to the under surface see this is the tympanic membrane here and how the glomus is adherent to the uh, uh, to the undersurface. And why is it tymp tympanicum? It's a localized uh, glomus on the promontory. Why is it from the promontory? Because it is supposed to be arising from the uh, from the paraganglionic cells around the carotico tympanic artery and in the close vicinity to the Jacobson's nerve. So this is a localized glomus, the glomus tympanicum type A, the jugular bulb is here, mind you, the jugular bulb is here and it's got no communication with the glomus and it is, as I said, see it's like it's residing onto the promontory. You can see the basal turn of the cochlea, you can see the carotid and you can very well see that the bone over the carotid is intact. So you know that the, the tumor is, is in no way involving the carotid arteries. So this is a glomus tympanicum. 
This is again glomus tympanicum of the hypotemporizing a little lower down. So this is the glomus tympanicum. You can see the vertical part of the carotid and you can definitely see the bone intact between the glomus and the, uh, the carotid artery. The basal turns of the cochlea, you can see the geniculate ganglion here. You can see the tensor tympani. You can see the hand, part of the head and the handle of the malleus. Okay, glomus tympanicum, the fact that this one was a glomus tympanicum, this one over here was a glomus tympanicum, can be proven by the by doing an MR angiography. And when you see that the MR, when you see the MR, MR angiography, you can see this thin, both this small tumor here, this small tumor here, and how through, the, through a blood vessel it is connected, finally connected to the Gloom, uh, the jugular bulb. So this is a small glomus tympanicum, a small glomus tympanicum. You can see the internal carotid artery here. So it's a small glomus tympanicum. <clears throat> okay. From the glomus, we move to another tumor of the jugular foramen and which is a jugular foramen tumor, uh, a jugular foramen schwannoma. Now, what are the nerves that we have within the jugular foramen? So we have the ninth, we have the 10th and we have the 11th. Mind you, the 12th is in a separate cavity, a separate canal. It's called the hypoglossal canal. So this is the jugular bulb here. This is the carotid artery here. But see at the smooth lobulated expansile lesion that you have here. More importantly, now I'll go back to the previous slides again, especially of the glomus. You see that the shadow is homogeneous. There is no intralesional speculation over here, unlike the glomus. Okay, unlike the glomus, you can see these intralesional speculations here. So once again, the salt and pepper appearance. Now we compare the salt and pepper appearance of the glomus with the with this particular tumor, it's much more smoother. It has eroded bone, no doubt about that. It's much more smoother. It appears much more lo better lobulated and it is a homogeneous shadow. So this is a jugular foramen schwannoma. Now, whether it's arising from the ninth nerve, whether 10th nerve or the 11th nerve, very difficult to say. You can say that from the symptoms, I might be able to ascertain not necessary. Suppose it's arising from the 10th nerve, it's a vagal nerve schwannoma. Okay, it's a vagal nerve schwannoma leading to a paralysis of the vocal cord, but the jugular foramen is a tight compartment. The moment it expands, it's going to involve the ninth nerve anteriorly and the 11th nerve posteriorly. So it will be, it, it could very jolly well easy, easily lead to a paralysis of the glossopharyngeal and the accessory as well. So it's very difficult to say what we definitely know that it's a jugular foramen tumor, what we, defi if, uh, we definitely know that it's not a glomus, but whether it's, whether it's arising from the 9th or the 10th or the 11th is very difficult to ascertain. Same jugular foramen schwannoma from the coronal aspect. So this is the huge jugular foramen schwannoma. You can see the mastoid segment of the facial nerve. Posterior semicircular canal, posterior semicircular canal, lateral semicircular canal. Probably you can make out the shadow of the superior semicircular canal. This is the middle cranial fossa. This is the posterior cranial fossa. This is the internal, internal auditory canal. This is the jugular foramen of the opposite side, okay, which is absolutely normal uh, <clears throat> on the right side. Okay, so some interesting cases uh, now. Cases which you would probably, uh, I don't know, I hope all of you are fortunate enough to see them. But how many of you have seen CT scans of otosclerosis showing the double cochlear sign? So this is the actual cochlea. And this is the demineralization that is following, the, uh, following around the cochlea. So this is the double cochlea sign of otospongiosis. I personally prefer using the term otospongiosis. The otosclerosis is the common term used. So this is the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve, the tympanic segment, head of malleus, body, uh, neck and lateral process. But what I want you to want to show you is the demineralization that is occurring around the cochlea, giving it the double cochlea sign. Another view, actual view, 
same patient. This is the actual cochlea. This is the interscalar septum, and this is the demineralization around the cochlea over here, both anteriorly, laterally, and medially, compared to the normal side. So this is the double cochlea sign. Bilateral, same patient, both sides, you can appreciate the demineralization around the entire cochlea, both on the left and on the right side. So this is the, uh, this is the double cochlea sign. From the double cochlea sign, we move, it to, we move to the glowing cochlea sign, which is seen in fibro-osseous dysplasia. So because of excessive ossification, you have a hyperintensity around the cochlea, which gives it the growing cochlea sign. But don't, don't just get restricted to this beautiful view. Look how thick the tympanic bone has become. Look how thick the uh, outer cortex of the mastoid ha uh, bone has become, which is obviously, and the ground glass appearance, see, uh, compared to the previous, uh, Previous uh, uh, appearances of the mastoid cortex, this is the typical ground glass appearance, which is so characteristic of fibro-osseous dysplasia. This is fibro-osseous dysplasia. This is fibro-osseous dysplasia. You can see it around the three turns of the cochlea and around the, the vestibule and the internal artery canal with thickening of the bones, in <clears throat> overall thickening the temporal uh, temporomastoid complex you know see the glowing cochlea this is called the typical glowing cochlea sign of fibro osseous dysplasia this is obviously the actual view the basal turn of the cochlea middle and the apical turn interscalar septum internal carotid internal artery canal foramina for the cochlear nerve the modulus basal turn of the cochlea foot plate of the stapes the the posterior semicircular canal the vestibular aqueduct with the operculum and the thickened bone all around so fibro osseous dysplasia okay. Now, remember, so a widened IAC, is it always synonymous with vestibular schronoma? Maybe, maybe not. Why? Because obviously this definitely is pathological. This definitely is pathological. But more important than that, the reason I have put these slides are because of this slide. Okay, it's 5.23. Uh, I want again the participants to put in their answers in the chat. Is this internal artery canal normal? 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 Please put in your answers in the chat if you can. Please put in your answers into the chat if you can. Whether you consider these internal artery canals normal or not because this is what the patient had. This is what the patient had. So CT is not the diagnostic modality of a CP angle tumor, irrespective of whether it's a schwannoma or a meningioma or a lipoma or an epidermoid. The point is that an MR with gadolinium has to be performed. This patient is the same as this patient. This patient and this patient are the same, and this patient was harboring. This, just look at the size of the vestibular schwannoma this patient is harboring. Look at the amount of cerebellar and brainstem compression. There's in fact a midline shift over here. So do not, don't waste the patient's money. If you are dealing with a patient of an asymmetrical sensorineural perceptive hearing loss, the investigation, initial investigation modality that needs to be undertaken is an MR with gadolinium. Just because the MR or without gadolinium is normal does not mean that the patient cannot harbor a small vestibular schwannoma. You could have a very small intracanalicular vestibular schwannoma, which not, might not be seen on a T1 or a T2 weighted image. 
which might not be seen on a T1 or a T2 weighted image. And the GAD is the only way you are going to visualize a small intracanalicular or you could have an intralabyrinthine vestibular schwannoma involving either the vestibule or the basal turn of the cochlea, which you are definitely going to miss even after doing an MRI if your MRI is without gadolinium. This is a meningioma. One on the left panel is on the right side. This is the right side, the left panel, the right panel on the left side. How do you differentiate between a meningioma and uh, some other, the other tumors? The most important part is A, the meningioma has a flat base. It has a flat base because it arises, it is arising from the meninges, right? It is arising from the dura. So it, since the dura is adherent to the posterior face of the petrous bone, the tumor will, will spread along the posterior face of the petrous bone. So its delineation along the posterior face of the petrous bone will be much more linear and sharper compared to the previous one. Please look how rounded this is. Okay, it is rounded. It's coming off the surface of the petrous bone. I mean, it's not necessarily following. This is the posterior face of the petrous bone, right? It's not necessarily following the posterior face of the petrous bone, unlike a meningioma, which is following the posterior face of the petrous bone. And more important is this, which is called a dural tail sign. Wherever the meningioma ends, there is inflammation of the dura beyond both proximal and in the distal part of the meningioma. You can always find hyper, I mean, because of inflammation or increased rather, rather increased vascularity, you would find the dura hyper intense. And this is called the dural tail sign of a meningioma. So a dural tail sign and the flat base of the meningioma of the tumor is more uh, more uh, sort of uh, congruent with a meningioma rather than any other tumor. Now, this is what I was talking about. I'm sorry, I have included a few MRI slides here just to give you an idea that as far as CP angle tumors are concerned, MRI is your investigation of choice. Don't ask for a CT and then ask for an MRI again. First do an MRI and then if there is any confusion, then go in for a CT scan. So this is the small tumor in the close to the fundus of the internal auditory canal. This tumor is actually extending into the basal turn of the cochlea. This is not the normal cochlea. This is not the normal cochlea, my friends, and it is also extending into the vestibule. This is the normal uh, shadow of the lateral semicircular canal. This is not the normal shadow of the vestibule. This is not the normal shadow of the uh, uh, for, of the within the, within the fundus, and this is definitely not the normal shadow of uh, within uh, within the basal turn of the cochlea. So this is a small fundal vestibular schwannoma with extension into the basal turn of the cochlea and extension into the vestibule. Again, another small, very, very small, I, I remember diagnosing this case way back in 2006. And when we come to the MRIs later on, I'll give you the interesting history that this patient had. So look at the size of the vestibular schwannoma. This is post contrast. And there are very high chances that if you had not used contrast here, if you had done a plain, a plain MRI, you would have probably missed this small vestibular schwannoma. So this is a small intracanal. It was probably, uh, I don't remember the size exactly, and maybe I'll have to go to the software and you know do a two-dimensional measurement, but it's a very, very small intracanalicular vestibular schwannoma. Okay, uh, coming towards the last few slides, I hope I finish on time. So this is an endolymphatic sac tumor. This is the area of the endolymphatic sac here. This is the operculum. So an endolymphatic sac tumor here. It's a very, very rare tumor. It's a very, very rare tumor. Uh, literature does not uh, mention, publications do not mention more than 150, at least till uh, three or four years ago when I had last diagnosed an, an, a case of endolymphatic sac tumor, the literature was mentioning somewhere in the range of 150. I don't know what the number is presently, but this is an endolymphatic sac tumor. And how do you differentiate it from an enlarged endolymphatic sac? 
an enlarged uh, a large vestibular aqueduct syndrome or an enlarged endolymphatic sac which is usually seen in children it's the commonest cause of congenital hearing loss uh, right which is much much different from uh, an annual lymphatic sac tumor usually it's uh, usually it's an adenocarcinoma uh, i'm sorry i'm forgetting the pathology it's locally invasive what is more important is it erodes the bone in an irregular fashion and once again there is intra lesional calcification whereas if it had been an enlarged vestibular aqueduct it would have been a smoother enlargement here like somewhat like this this iso intense shadow would have extended inside uh, like a smooth shadow uh, a smooth uh, you know uh, appearance and it would have not have any of these intra lesional uh, speculation okay this is the same endolymphatic shadow uh, sac pathology see how it has come in close contact with the tympanic membrane you can see the tympanic membrane here it's come in close contact with the tympanic membrane so this is the entire endolymphatic sac tumor it's come in close proximity to the eustachian tube opening and you can see the normal endolymph oh, i'm i'm so sorry i'm so sorry this is the vestibular aqueduct but so you can see the normal vestibular aqueduct over here okay now typical lesions this is a petrous apex an aerated petrous apex and this is a petrous apex with as with an iso intense shadow singly i mean unilobular smooth shadow a diagnosis and you can see that there's a lot of effusion into the mastoid antrum so this is a petrous apex granuloma we will discuss the differential diagnosis of the of a granuloma say from a petrous epicytis or a petrous apex tumor later on uh, maybe during the mri uh, discussion but this is a petrous apex granuloma mind you in a granuloma the other helping point uh, the factor that helps you in coming to a conclusion of a petrous apex granuloma crystal granuloma is that the other side is all is pneumatized you see a granuloma a cholesterol granuloma cannot occur in a, in a in a petrous apex which has marrow and obviously it cannot occur in a petrous apex which is sclerotic it has to have an air cell it has to have an air cell basically it's somewhat similar to having an effusion in the mid layer the aeration pathway to this air cell is obstructed the aeration pathway to this air cell is obstructed the mucosa here starts secreting fluid because it's an air cell once in a while there is excessive negative pressure which leads to some hemorrhaging here the the blood which hemorrhages into the area it disintegrates releasing cholesterol lipids and proteins and it is that fluid which appears as an expansile shadow so a cholesterol granuloma by default has to was previously actually an apical air cell so if it is a cholesterol granuloma and i say, as i said symmetry is usually maintained so you will have an apical air cell on the other side it's very unlikely that you would have any other appearance on the other side so that's one of your uh, it's one of the uh, man ways in which you can understand uh, obviously the final confirmation is is with mri is with the appearance on mri which uh, we, we will not be discussing here same patient so you can see the petrous apex air cell occupied by a smooth iso intense shadow but here the petrous apex air cell is absolutely normal so this is a petrous apex granuloma almost towards the end this is a chondrosarcoma now you need to know about two or three tumors as far as the base of the skull or the middle for base of the skull and the clivus is concerned one is the chordoma and the other is the chondrosarcoma or the chondroma the chondrosarcoma is the malignant version the con is the malignant version excuse me please and the chondroma is the benign version it's the chondrosarcoma which is more common the important differentiating factor between the two is a chordoma is more midline oriented but that's not the gospel truth again why because the chordoma arises from the notochordal remnants and we all know that the notochord is a midline structure whereas as a chondrosarcoma is actually arising from the cartilage a chondro 
chondro, right? Which means cartilaginous. So where is that cartilage? That cartilage is at the foramen lacerum. Foramen lacerum from where the internal carotid artery comes out of the petrous bone and enters into the cavernous sinus. So where is the foramen lacerum? Where is the anterior part of the horizontal internal carotid artery? It's somewhere here. So the foramen lacerum is here. So I'll just go out. So the notochord is in the center and the foramen lacerum is on the lateral aspect. So a chondrosarcoma is a more lateral tumor, whereas a, no, a chordoma is a more medial tumor, but a chordoma can have lateral extensions. And a chondrosarcoma, instead of arising from the cartilage here, could arise from the cartilage of the synchondrosis, and therefore it could be a little more midline. So this is a chondrosarcoma. This again, and, and obviously you can see the intralesional calcification. This is very important, very, very important. I've prepared a small table for you. So this is the intralesional calcification. This is the normal side. This is the normal side. The jugular bulb might be widened, but the fact is that this is the normal side, whereas this is the pathological side. So this is a little lateral. This is a chondrosarcoma. This is also a chondrosarcoma, and you can see how it's so close to the jugular bulb, how it's so close to the uh, carotid artery, how it's causing the erosion of the clivus, right? The clivus, okay? So this is a chondrosarcoma. This is a chondroblastoma, a chondrosarcoma and a chondroblastoma. Obviously, these are histopathological changes, but this seems to be arising also from the temporal bone. Okay, so this is a chondroblastoma. This is a chondroblastoma. Look at the shadow of the chondrosarcoma and look at the shadow of the chondroblastoma. Because it's a chondroblastoma, it will tend to produce more cartilaginous elements and therefore give out a more hyper intense shadow. Okay, this is again a chondroblastoma. See how it is also in close prox. It is actually going into the glenoid, close, coming close to the glenoid fossa. It is eroding the, uh, the, the uh, tympanic bone as well. There is also a theory that a chondroblastoma might also arise from the cartilage within the temp temporomandibular joint, right? This is another, uh, the same patient, chondroblastoma, and this is a slightly lateral chordoma. Within the chordoma, you do not see, it's a much smoother shadow, though it's an equally malignant and uh, spreading tumor, but you do not see much of an intralesional calcification within a chordoma. That's another, that's another uh, chordoma for, the, for you. And this is the table that I was talking about. That is petrous apex lesions, the CT scan characteristics. I've taken it from the well-known paper by Jackler and Parker. That is the differential diagnosis of petrous apex lesion, which was uh, published way back in 1992 in the American Journal of Otology. Earlier, it was called the American Journal of Otology, and now it's known as the Otology, Neurotology. So these are the lesions that you might expect in the petrous apex. As I said, this is not an exhaustive lecture. I will not be able to show you all the pathologies. The scans that I have shown you are the scans that I have accumulated over my personal, uh, from, in, from my personal collection in the last 20 years. So there could be scans, there could be pathologies which I might not be able to show you. So in a cholesterol granuloma, you do have bone erosion, but the margins are smooth. And as I said, remember that the contralateral apex is usually pneumatized because it has to be symmetry and there is no contrast enhancement with, uh, in a cholesterol granuloma. In a cholesteatoma, there is bone erosion, no doubt, there it is smooth. We can have petrous apex cholesteatoma. We can have petrous apex cholesteatoma, which could be acquired or which could be, could be congenital, but all that will be not, we won't be discussing now because we're running out of time, but the contralateral apex may not be pneumatized because end of the day, cholesteatoma 
is a problem of lack of pneumatization within the entire mastoid system. So even the other side might not be, is more often than not, not pneumatized rather than being highly pneumatized like in a cholesterol granuloma. And obviously there is no contrast enhancement. What is petrous epicytis? Petrous epicytis is when you have effusion into the petrous apex, somewhat like Gredinigo's syndrome. You have effusion into the petrous apex. You have effusion here as well. But the infection, the, the fusion gets infected, therefore leading, an inf leading to an inflammatory, infective, inf inflammatory infection of the petrous apex, leading to things like, you know, uh, 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 the absent nerve palsy because it's in close uh, contact with the petrous apex. So in a petrous apex, again, there can be bone erosion, whereas in effusion, there'll be no bone erosion. Both these actually conditions are in continuum. The patient can first have a petrous apex effusion, which in turn, might get infected which in turn might get infected and lead to a petrous epicytis. So the moment it turns into a petrous epicytis, its chances of bone erosion include, increase. Obviously, there is irregular erosion of margin, but an effusion will not cause erosion. On the contrary, if it is an effusion, the trabeculations will be maintained. Remember, the trabeculations will be maintained. The obvious, the contralateral apex could be variable. It could be the same. It could be different. It could be pneumatized. It could be sclerotic. Whereas in effusion, the contralateral side is also pneumatized because for the effusion to occur there has to be an air cell effusion cannot occur in a sclerotic a petrous apex it cannot occur in a in a petrous apex which has bone marrow obviously bone marrow can be asymmetrical even under normal conditions so if there is bone marrow asymmetry, there is bone marrow asymmetry. There's nothing much to talk about. What happens when there is carotid aneurysm? We've seen that beautiful picture. There is bone erosion. There, it's, it's smooth. It's smooth, but the contralateral apex can be variable and there is definite contrast enhancement. There is definite contrast enhancement in a carotid aneurysm. And finally, coming to neoplasm, there is bone erosion, erosion of the margins, uh, the margins of the lesion, can be variable, the contralateral apex can be variable, and the contrast enhancement can be variable. Please do remember that the erosion of the margins, I mean the erosion of the bone by the margins of the tumor, it could be irregular erosion or a smooth erosion. A smooth erosion is seen in schwannoma and a chordoma like I showed you, whereas an irregular erosion is seen in CP angle tumors like the meningioma, the glomus, the, the, uh, the chordoma, sorry, the chondroma and the chondrosarcoma. Okay, so rem try remembering this table, but then don't fret and fume about it. I'm sure this paper is easily available. It's a free publication now. So you can actually pick up this paper from the net and keep it as a ready reference for yourself. Thank you very much. I think I've finished dot on time at 5.45. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Very nice and great presentation, sir. I hope now it will be easier for the participant to get the uh, view of pathologies what we see in the regular temporal bone CTs. Right, sir. Thank you so much, Dr. Mahajan. Thank you so much. Uh, in case we have time and in case we have questions, I'm just going through the chat, but in case I miss something, please do let me know. Sir, there is a confusion for some of the participants regarding this cobra head appearance, sir, that mm -hmm. uh, yeah, snake eye appearance. They are confused whether to tell it for facial nerve or to say it for the superior semicircular canals. You have cleared actually that doubt in the last lecture, but you can still repeat, sir. It. See, uh, as far as the books that I have, I, I mean, I, I'll just recheck them again. But the books that I have, most of them refer to the tympanic segment and the, and the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve in the coronal section as the cobra, uh, the snake eye appearance. Obviously the cobra head appearance can only be this because you have to have the cochlea. So there is no doubt as far as the cobra head appearance is concerned, correct? The doubt is the snake eye appearance. The doubt is as far as the snake eye appearance is concerned. Now, if you really ask me, if you really ask me if I am an examiner and if I know that both the superior semicircular canal the upper part of the superior semicircular canal on an axial section and the facial nerve segments on a coronal section, the anterior part of the facial nerve sections on the coronal sections are cobra head appearance. 
would I really get a pleasure out of harassing a student who I am examining as an examiner? If the student tells me, sir, I think it's the two lumens of the superior semicircular canal, I'll say fair enough, if I'm aware of it, fair enough. But do you think there is another uh, snake eye appearance? So, so you get my point, Dr. Mahajan, what I'm trying to say? Yeah, yeah, sir. I got it. Sir. You see, you see, let's not be very rigid. Let's not get into the, I mean, there are two things I'm very skeptical about. Appearances, you know, this uh, cobra, I, uh, cobra head appearance. I do, I have used it. You might say that you have used it yourself. I do use it to convey a message, but there are two things I'm very skeptical about syndromes and appearances. Okay. I have used the W sign. I have used the sleeping T sign. I have used this. I have used that. But end of the day, if I am an examiner, I'm sure this confusion is more for our junior younger friends than for the senior consultants. If, if I am an examiner and if, if, if the, uh, the student tells me one before the other, I'm sure I'll give the student that much of leeway that fi fine. The student knows that there is something uh, called a snake eye appearance. So for me, it's always been the two segments of the facial nerve, but yes, you can consider in the actual scans, the two lumens of the superior semicircular canal as the snake eye appearance as well. Sir, uh, can you repeat the names of the books uh, which you referred for the radiology, sir? One of the participants has asked. My first Gita is this. Okay, this is only temporal bone. This has nothing else, only temporal bone. But then I also use, this is the whole of head and neck. Mam, um, uh, Mahmood and uh, Valvasori. Valvasori is the same gentleman, you know, when we come to the endolymphatic sac, you know, enlarged endolymphatic sac, he's the one who gave the 1.5 millimeter uh, cutoff point for the measurement of the endolymphatic, uh, sorry, for the vestibular aqueduct. And the third is Soman Curtin. But I really wonder why do these youngsters need these books anymore? I mean, uh, they, they have everything on the net, you know, all the publications and all these wonderful methods of downloading things free of cost. You know, it's all available to these youngsters these days. I'm still not aware what is available where, but these are the three books. As I said, my Gita, my Bible, my Torah, my Quran. Every time I have a confusion, I always go back to these books. Always, always, always. Any other question, please? Hello? Yes, sir. That's what I'm checking. I don't yeah, yeah, please, questions. please. Sir, how to decide when we need a contrast or non-contrast HRCT temporal bone? Okay. See, personally speaking, it will all depend upon you. It's like, what are you looking at? Okay. In the sense, oops. What is it that you want to look at? If you want to look at the bony integrity, do you really need contrast? No, correct. If you want to look at the bony integrity, you are not really, you don't really need contrast. If there is a patient of cholesteatoma and your idea is to, and the patient is vertiginous and your idea is to look for a lateral semicircular canal fistula or for that matter fistula of any canal, you will not ask for a contrast. But a vertiginous patient with cholesteatoma might not always be a lateral semicircular canal fistula. What the patient might be complaining of, uh, of as a vertigo might actually be an ata ataxia. And that ataxia could be secondary to a lateral sinus thrombosis. The patient could be having a lateral sinus thrombosis. And the patient might actually be more uh, 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 having more of instability than a spinning vertigo. So, in, and the patient could be having headache or vomiting or photophobia. So, on the one hand, for this, you do not need contrast. On the other hand, you need contrast for sure as far as lateral sinus thrombosis is concerned. If you are dealing with a patient of glomus, you are seeing a, a, a granulation tissue in the external auditory canal. 
simple dictum is never do an HP examination from a, from a uh, reddish polyp in the external auditory canal. Yes, we all agree to that. But would a normal CT scan help you without contrast? No. So it all depends upon the, the it's, it's not an all encompassing list or a list wherein you can say one size fits all. You cannot say that. It's your clinical history. It's your clinical examination. It's what you as a clinician are doubting your DDs, right? Your differential diagnosis is going to let you decide whether you want an HRCT, whether you want an HRCT with contrast or whether you want an MRI. So there cannot be one size fits all. It is an acumen that you develop gradually over a period of time during your, during your practice, whether private or hospital based, doesn't matter. Uh, Shri Arsha? Yes, sir. Yeah. So should we conclude the session now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So thank you, Manush, sir, for a very wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, sir. So hope to see you soon in next week. Uh, yeah, Shri Arsha will be putting the details in the Facebook page. Yeah, I'll speak to him and we'll finalize the date for the next week. So yeah. Sir. Yes, sir. Dear participants, we'll announce the, uh, I mean, uh, the original schedule dates have been changed because of sir's personal re reasons. We'll be putting up the new dates in our Facebook page soon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Thank you. Thank Have you, everyone. Nice Thank evening. you, Shah. Thank you. Bye-bye.